We're going to continue our trip through Chapter 3, looking at national income and its determination, um, with lecture number 3. And in this lecture, we're going to look at the market for factors. And particularly, we have two factors, remember, that we've assumed in this model, labor and capital. And so we need to have a labor market and a capital market. And in, that, in those markets, we need to determine the quantity of labor that will be demanded and supplied, so equilibrium quantity of labor and the equilibrium price or the wage rate, and the same for capital, so equilibrium quantity of capital and the wage rate. Or I'm sorry, not the wage rate, but the rental price of capital is what we'll talk about. So we're going to begin with a, a pretty restrictive simplifying assumption that in later chapters will help will try to relax a bit. But to start out with, we're going to assume that capital, the supply of capital is fixed, the supply of labor is fixed, and that the state of technology is fixed. So if all those things are fixed, then what do we have? We have that our production or our output or potential GDP is fixed. All right. So what you could call as aggregate supply of goods, Y, is fixed by the fixed supply of capital, the fixed supply of labor. So our two inputs, we know how much that is. It's, we're going to call that K bar and L bar. We'll put the little bar over the top of it to indicate that it's fixed with a fixed technology. So nothing in the, um, uh, the production function is changing. And if nothing, none of this changes, then this is invariant, right? So Y is just fixed. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the notation we're going to use. First of all, W is going to be what we call the nominal wage. So the wage rate, so that's the return to labor, right? how much we pay labor, without any adjustment for price level. R will be the nominal rental rate of capital. Right, that's how much we pay capital. And so if you own capital and you allow it to be used, you'll get paid R, and that's unadjusted for price level. P is going to be the price of output. It's the aggregate price level. And so W divided by P will be the real wage rate, and R divided by P will be the real rental rate. Remember, whenever we divide by price level, we divide nominal by price level, we get the real um, level. How factor prices are determined? The factor prices are determined by supply and demand of factors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So recall, the supply of each factor is fixed. So what about demand? But wait a minute, let's, let's look at this. So what is the supply going to look like? Well, it's going to look something like this. So let's put capital here, and we'll put the rental price of capital, or we can even put the real rental price of capital if we want to. Because what's going to happen? Well, how much is capital? How much is the supply? It's fixed. So does it matter what the price is? Nope. What is it when it's here? K bar. What is it when it's here? K bar. What is it when it's here? K bar, right? No matter what the price is, it's always going to be K bar. It's fixed. The same thing with labor. But the next thing we need to determine, though, is demand. So we have the supply of, the fun of um, labor and supply in each of the factor models. Supply of capital, supply of labor. But what about demand for each one of these? So let's take a look. All right, now this part is going to require a little bit of calculus. So um, stay with me. And if this just completely blows your mind, make sure you check out the review videos because I have a review video um, dealing with optimization, a review video dealing with basic differentiation posted on the course website. So we're going to talk about factor demand. And we have to think about this in terms of well, what does a firm want to do? Right? The firm has to make a question. So a manager of a firm has to answer this question. They have to answer the question, how do I, well, make the most profit possible given all these other things I have to have? All right. So the firm's problem is to choose capital and labor, choose capital and labor that maximizes all right, profit. And, and, and so what's profit? Well, it's equal to our how much we sell, our total revenue, which is price times, well, quantity, which would be y, but, well, we can go ahead and put in our function, all right? So that's price, that's overall price level, times how much we produce. So if we produce 10 units and the price level is 10, how much did we make? $100 in revenue. But we all know revenue is not the only thing. We also have to have cost. So subtract off of that what? 
Well, we'll subtract through here. Um, how much did we spend on capital? We spent R times our capital. And then how much did we spend on labor? We spent W times our labor. Okay? Now I'm going to do, well, one little trick. If I go through and then I divide this whole thing through by P, well, that's going to give me basically the same. It's not going to really change the um, choice of capital and labor because I'm dividing everything through by the same amount. Um, it changes what this equals because then it'll be you know, real revenue minus or, or production minus the real cost of capital minus the real cost of labor. But we'll, we'll get the same thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm just going to divide through by P and I'm going to end up with this problem here, max choosing K and L, the production function minus the cost of capital minus the cost of labor. Now let me do one more step and let me go ahead and put in for the production function our Cobb-Douglas production function. So that will be Okay, that will be maximize choosing K and L, the um, production function, which is A times K to the alpha, L times 1 minus alpha, L to the 1 minus alpha, minus R over P times capital, minus W over P times L. Okay, very simple. It's just how much we produce minus how much it costs us to produce it. That's all this is. And then I just want to choose, well, what makes that function, this, this whole thing right here, as big as possible? Okay, so how do we do that? Well, basically we're going to take the derivative and set the derivative equal to zero. Now usually we have to worry about both the first order conditions, which is the first derivatives, and the second order conditions, which would be the second derivative. Right, and it gets a little complicated in there. For right now, though, we're going to ignore the second order conditions. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that by just saying, well, I've checked the second order conditions and I know they work for this one. Right, so for all of these Cobb-Douglas production functions that we use that look like this, they have constant returns to scale, you don't need to worry about the second order conditions, which, by the way, those second order conditions happen to be that we have marginal product of capital, marginal product of labor are diminishing. That's what they are, but we're not going to worry about that from now. For right now, you're just going to believe me that I've checked them and that they work. And so we're going to focus on just the first order conditions for right now. Okay, so I'm going to clear this off and start right at the top with my function. Okay, I've rewritten my function, uh, or my, my maximization problem, and now what I want to do is write out the first order conditions. So I'm going to call these the first order conditions. And the first one I have is for capital. So what has to be true for this about capital for this to be maximized? And what I want to do is I want to take the first derivative of this guy up here. Let me change colors. First derivative of what we call my objective function with respect to capital and set that equal to zero. That'll be my first first order condition. We have two choice variables, capital and labor. We have to choose how much capital and how much labor. And so what do we need? We need to choose that. Uh, we need a first order condition for both capital and for labor. So the first one's capital. So let's just take the derivative of that. So the derivative of this first part, which is the production function, is just the marginal product of capital. Okay, so I'm going to take a shortcut and I'm just going to write down it's MPK. It's just the marginal product of capital. The derivative of the production function with respect to capital is the marginal product of capital. Minus, well, R over P times K. If I take the derivative of that, all I have left is R over P. And I set that equal to zero. Next, I want to do the same thing for labor. Okay, and what does that tell me? I know that the derivative of the production function with respect to labor is, you guessed it, MPL. And I'm going to subtract off minus, well, first of all, there's no L in R over P times K, so that's just zero when I take the derivative of that, so I don't have to worry about that. I just go straight on to the 
w over p times l. And if I take the derivative of that, what is it? It's just w over p. And then I set that equal to 0. Okay, why am I setting this equal to 0? Because when it's equal to 0, that's where it's maximized. So what do our first order conditions tell us? Well, with a little bit of algebraic manipulation, I get what? That the marginal product of capital equals the real rental price of capital. And the marginal product of labor equals the real wage rate. So in equilibrium, what happens? The marginal product of capital equals the real rental rate of capital. And in equilibrium, the marginal product of labor equals the real wage rate of labor. So what, what, what can we get from that? Well, if what I want to do is I want to plot on the top, plot, plot this demand function, well, I can do that pretty easily. And that turns out to be, so if I do it for capital, I put K here. And I put the real wage, a real rental price of capital here, which is R over P. I know it's this guy. And it happens to equal the marginal product of capital. So this demand for capital adjusted for inflation, so we have everything in real terms, is just the marginal product of capital. And I know it's diminishing. I know it's downward sloping. Why? Because, well, I know that because, well, marginal product of capital is diminishing. And we showed that for the Cobb-Douglas production function. And if I put on top of this the supply of capital, so we'll call that the supply of capital, which is what? K bar, because it's fixed, we understand that what happens? The real rental price of capital, we'll call that R star over P, the real rental price of capital equals what? The place where the marginal product of capital and this K bar are um, come together, all right, where they intersect. So we solve those to that system of equations, and we've got that. And we can do the exact same thing, right, for labor. If we just put labor here, we'll put the real wage rate here. Here's the demand for um, labor in real terms. That's what? Marginal product of labor. And we put in the supply of labor. We'll put make sure that we notate that right. That's supply of capital. And what happens? Well, it's within this interaction that we have the real wage rate determined. So now that we've built this demand for our factor markets, we need to take a step back and look at and make sure we understand the assumptions that we're making behind that model. Because there are a couple of assumptions. And the big assumption we've made so far, other than we have constant returns to scale and a Cobb-Douglas production function, are that our markets, our factor markets, are competitive. What does that mean? That means the firm takes the wage rate as given. They don't have any influence over the wage rate. So their actions don't change the wage rate. Their actions won't change the wage rate. And the rental price of capital, they take that as given. So any actions on the part of the firm will not affect the rental um, rate of capital. Now you're saying, well, wait a minute. It has to affect it because they're in the market. Well, yeah, that's right. But no individual firm can have a significant impact. Remember, this goes back to principles of micro. There's many, many firms. And so when the firm decides to um, employ one more person or employ one more unit of capital, it's a little like trying to add a little bit of water to the ocean with a bucket. Yeah, if I dump a bucket of water in the ocean, I guess sea level goes up, theoretically. But by such a small amount, who cares? Right. And then also overall price level is taken as given. So to pay, really bring this down to the basic idea, the common sense that we've made really difficult, it's very simple. The firm hires a factor, in this case labor, as long as the cost does not exceed the benefit. As long as benefits outweigh costs, we buy it. Once costs exceed the benefit, once it costs more than it's worth, we stop buying. All right. So in this case, cost for labor is the real wage rate. And the benefit is the marginal product of labor. And as long as the cost is below the marginal product of labor, what do I want to do? I want to hire more. If the cost is above the marginal product of labor, what do I want to do? I want to hire less. And so I will 
come to the point where the real wage rate equals the marginal product of labor. Same thing with capital. Okay, our next question though becomes, how do we determine how much money is allocated to, um, or excuse me, no, we're not talking about money, how much production gets allocated, this, this income gets allocated to laborers, and how much gets allocated to the owners of capital? Right, so we want to know we have Y, right? That's this total output. Well, who gets what? Who gets Y? So how is Y distributed? So first of all, total labor income has to equal what? Well, it's the real wage rate times the quantity of labor. Well, the quantity of labor is what? L bar. Okay. And total capital compensation, total income that goes to capital, is the real rental price of capital times the amount of capital which is, well, K bar times the real rental price of capital. And guess what? We know that in equilibrium, the real wage rate is marginal product of labor, the real rental price of capital is marginal product of capital, and so we have that total labor income is going to be MPL times L bar, right? Because L is fixed, right? It's fixed at L bar. And the total income to capital is marginal product of capital times K bar. You say, well, why do I care? Well, just, just hold on for a second. If the production function has constant returns to scale, which is something we've assumed and will assume throughout the semester, then we have the following result. Y bar, or total output, equals the marginal product of labor times L bar plus the marginal product of capital times K bar. Now, you might say, well, why is that? Well, if you really are interested and want to see some math, go look up uh, um, Euler's theorem for homogeneous functions. Now, Euler was a very, very prolific mathematician. Uh, and you know, basically, if you put in the problem with Euler is if you put in Euler's theorem, you have to be more specific. I mean, this guy just is uber famous. He even has a number. It's, his number is E. It's called Euler's constant. In any event, all right, Euler's theorem for homogeneous functions. I don't care if you know that or not. All I care about is that you know that if the production function has constant returns to scale, then we have this result right here. And so we can figure out now how income is distributed. We have total national income, total labor income, total capital income, and we know that labor income plus capital income equals our total income. We don't have any weirdo leftover income that's unallocated. All of our income is allocated to either labor or capital, which is our two factors of production. So this is good. Now there's a very, very special part about the Cobb-Douglas production function. Now this is true of the Cobb-Douglas production function, but not necessarily true of production functions in general. Just the Cobb-Douglas production function. From the Cobb-Douglas production function, we know that alpha is equal to the capital, the, the share of income that goes to capital. So alpha is capital's share of total income. And 1 minus alpha is labor's share of total income. Now this is true for our Cobb-Douglas production function with constant returns to scale. All right, don't generalize that beyond what we've just said. Now I can show this through you, you can, and you can prove this on your own actually by just working this out. But uh, we, we won't worry about that for this class. And that concludes um, lecture number three for um, chapter three.